If we can settle down, um, I'd like to get the evening started. First and foremost, welcome to each and every one of you uh, for joining us here for this uh, lecture. Um, before I pass this on to Dean Fraser to introduce our speaker, I wanted to take a moment to recognize two previous uh, DUDA chairs who are with us this uh, uh, evening. I see the first one over there, Marlon Ream, Dr. Ream, and Catherine Gauchert is in the audience someplace. There she is. Okay. So, would you please recognize the two? And, and if you happen to have one of these devices with you, would you please uh, shut it off? Uh, I'll remember to do that myself. Uh, and and uh, if you could shut that off for this evening. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce to you uh, Dean Sherry Fraser, who will then introduce our speaker this evening. Good evening and welcome. It's wonderful to have so many here this evening. Holder of the Duda Chair in Religion, the Reverend Dr. Patrick Mayans, is Professor of Religion and Greek at Concordia, New York, where he teaches courses in New Testament, Biblical Greek, and Liturgy. He received his Master of Divinity from Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, his MA in Art History from the University of Kentucky, and his PhD in Religious Studies from Marquette University. He's a member of the North American Patristic Society and the International Center for Medieval Art. Dr. Bayan's recent and current research projects include the iconography on an early Christian alms box, the frescoes of the 12th century Iberian hermitage San Baudileo de Berlanga, the work of contemporary Ethiopian painter Tedesi Mesfin, the Temptation of Christ in the Gospel of Luke, and Ethiopian Marian iconography. In January of this year, Dr. Bayan spent three weeks in Ethiopia, exploring the liturgy and unique rituals with the Ethiopian Orthodox festivals of Christmas and Timcot, as well as the prevalent and dominating Ethiopian artist motif of the Blessed Virgin the Blessed Virgin Mary under a canopy of angelic wings. In this, his first Duda lecture, Dr. Bayans will present the results of his study of the ritual and rites of Ethiopian Timcot. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bayans. Bishop Benke and the Reverend Clergy, President George and the Honorable Faculty, students and guests of Concordia College, and John and Betty Duda, who have so generously made this day possible. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. amen. I am in the dark confines of Bet Meriam, redolent with incense and human sweat. The rock floor beneath me is uneven, and I feel it through my socks, which I fear are wearing through fast. I wonder if the boy I've hired to watch my shoes is still there. My guide is describing the frescoes above me. I fiddle with my camera, but it's difficult to find a level place and the right angle. I'm standing in the midst of a hundred pilgrims and more and they keep coming, pressing to get to the priest sitting in front of the Holy of Holies with its thickly draped curtain barring the way to a place where these seekers dare not go. They are eager to get his blessing, be touched by the well-worn hand cross which never leaves him, and arduously make their way to the ten other churches that are a part of this ancient maze and receive a blessing in each of them, too. 
and then find a place to spend the night on the floor of one of the churches, like they have done, who surround me at my feet, or maybe stake out some ground on one of the man-made cliffs that surround the labyrinth. For this is Lalabella, the eighth wonder of the world, the 11 12th century churches carved out of solid rock in the highlands of Ethiopia. And it is Christmas. If you want to play armchair archaeologist, then don't go to Lalabella at Christmas. For its churches are not museums, world heritage site and all notwithstanding. They are active places of worship, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And at this time of the year, they are packed with 100,000 pilgrims, some of whom have walked 300 kilometers and more, many on well-calloused bare feet, to touch and be touched, to drink water that has been blessed and, if possible, carry some back home, 300 kilometers back home. They are here to celebrate the birth of Christ. Some have claimed their ground days before my arrival. No fear of losing their place. They aren't going anywhere. Not even to buy food, not that there's much to buy. Anyway, they're fasting, rather vigorously, I'm told. The Divine Liturgy for Gena, Christmas, begins at 3 a.m. And this rock-hewn maze is packed even tighter than before. At dawn, the bishop emerges from the church and the colorful array of priests and deacons and choirs slowly makes its way to the rock ledge that overlooks Bet Meriam, as another group of singers below begins a very slow rhythmic chant accompanied by a large handheld portable drum. When the clergy with their 800 year old solid gold crosses have finally laboriously made their way to the ledge, the cantors or debtaras prayer stick in one hand, ancient sistrum in the other, join in the chant, slowly inching their way around the ledge, making a complete circuit as hundreds, myself included, strain to look up from below, and thousands more are warned not to get too close behind them. A fall here could be fatal. The chant continues for about four hours. Around nine o'clock, a weathered 90-year-old pilgrim offers me her prayer stick. It didn't take her too long to guess that I wasn't used to standing seven hours for worship. She smiles. I smile back, a bit red in the cheek. Every so often, the debtaras with prayer sticks and sistra make a profound, slow, deep, unison bow from the waist in the middle of their song. And the worshipers behind and below erupt into a thunderous, high-pitched ululation when they do. I'd try to duplicate it for you, but you'd think I was desperately in need of CPR. <laughs> I ask my guide what that's all about. And he tells me that the bow of the singers matches their song. The Son of God came down to us. The pilgrims hang on those words, their shrieks of joy electric. I was in Ethiopia for 18 days this past January, a dream come true, to see Lalabella, its crosses, its architecture and art. And 12 days later, experience the Ethiopian Christian feast par excellence, Timcot, the epiphany and baptism of our Lord, with its rituals that are unlike anything else in the world. That's really what I want to talk to you about tonight. Because I really do believe that there is something quite powerful here for us. 
I know that some of you have come quite a long way, and I do not want to disappoint you. Tim Cott did not disappoint me. But first, just a little bit from the history books. Ethiopia has had a Christian presence since at least the fourth century, and perhaps even earlier. Until it became autocephalous in 1959, its ecclesiastical head was appointed by the See of Alexandria. The Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedu Church continues to be in full communion with the so-called Oriental branches of Orthodoxy, namely the Coptic, Armenian, Syrian, Indian, and Eritrean, which accept only the canons of the first three ecumenical councils. For its part, Ethiopian Orthodoxy is characterized by a decidedly Jewish flavor in many of its rites and observances, such as eighth-day circumcision, the celebration of the liturgy on Saturday as well as Sunday, menstrual incubation, kosher butchering, and strict observance of many of the Mosaic dietary laws. This due, no doubt, to a long-standing Jewish presence in the country, the Beta Israel, or Falasha, most of whom have now emigrated to Israel. The fact that Ethiopia was for centuries cut off from the rest of Christendom, an island in an Islamic sea, certainly contributed to its unique liturgical flavor. However, the possibility of Judaic roots cannot be easily dismissed. Both Ethiopian Christianity and Judaism utilize the now dead ancient Semitic tongue of Ge'ez in their canonical texts and liturgical rites, and both employ ancient Egyptian instruments, such as the sistrum, in their singing. A visitor to Oxum or Gondor or Lalabella on a festival such as Christmas or Timcot might suppose that he or she had been transported back at least a thousand years. Time truly has stood still, especially in the northwestern highlands. A full 180 days out of the year are designated for fasting, by far the most of any Christian communion. Their biblical canon is also the largest. For centuries, it was the claim of Ethiopian monarchs that they descended from King Solomon of Old Testament fame, an assertion narrated in the great national epic, the Kibra Nagast, with its tale of the arrival of the Ark of the Covenant into Abyssinia, a claim once emblazoned into the Ethiopian constitution. The last of the so-called Solomonic monarchs, of course, was Haile Selassie, who was murdered by the Marxist dictatorship that ruled Ethiopia from 1974 to 1991, leaving in its wake not only the emperor, but the Orthodox patriarch, the general secretary of the Lutheran Church, and at least 12,000 other clergy martyred. The Ethiopian church's response in the 17 years that have elapsed since then is another story crying out to be told. According to Archbishop Timotheus, head of the Orthodox Seminary in Addis, the religious landscape of Ethiopia looks like this. Of the nation's 75 million incredibly impoverished masses, about 60% are Orthodox, 8% Lutheran and Pentecostal, 30% Muslim, and 2% animist or other. On now to Timcot, the Feast of the Epiphany. In distinction from Western Christendom, where the visit of the Magi is the focal point, in Ethiopian Orthodoxy, as in Eastern Christendom as a whole, Ethiopia Epiphany is the celebration of the Theophany, the manifestation and revealing of the Holy Trinity in the baptism of Christ in the Jordan by John. The Amharic word Timkot itself means baptism. And like all Orthodox celebrations of the feast, the Ethiopian liturgy concludes with the great blessing of the waters. 
Totally unique to Timcot, however, are the rights which lead up to it. Timcot begins with the solemn removal of the sacred tabot, or tabotat, plural, from the church, borne aloft on the heads of the most revered priests. The tabot is a piece of wood or stone, roughly a foot square and an inch thick, on which has been inscribed the namesake of the church, St. Mary, St. George, the Savior of the world, the Holy Trinity, or the like. It has been consecrated by a bishop, in many cases by the patriarch himself. It is the tabot which consecrates a church. Without the tabot, there is no church. And where the tabot goes, there goes the church. A tabot takes the gender of the one to whom it is consecrated. A tabot of Mary, for example, is referred to as she. According to Getachew Haile, the tabot, however, is, quote, more than a mere carrier of the name of a saint or one of the names of God inscribed upon it. In the mentality of the average Ethiopian Christian, God or the saint himself, herself, dwells in that church personified in the tabot, unquote. From a practical standpoint, the tabot is in some ways comparable to the Coptic altar stone. That is, it serves as an altar board for the celebration of the Eucharist. Even then, however, it is always covered with the finest of cloth. It resides in the Kedesta Kedoson, the Holy of Holies, which in a typically round Ethiopian church forms the innermost of three concentric spaces a room where priests and assisting deacons alone may go. The tabot is always kept from public view. Its placement in the church and the architecture of Ethiopian churches as a whole, with its clearly defined circles of increasing sanctity, not unlike that of the biblical temple, is at one with the Ethiopian liturgy itself. In the Anaphora of St. John, roughly comparable to the Liturgy of the Faithful in the Western Rite, it is said, O Lord, none can comprehend thee or see thee. Thy greatness is hidden in thee. Thy power is hidden in thee. Thou veilest thyself with thyself and hidest thyself in thyself. In thine invisibility thou art more distant than those who are farthest. Yet through thy mercy, Thou bringest near to thyself those who are far off, for thou visitest the humble through the advent of thy Son. God cannot be known, cannot be approached in his divinity. Therefore, in his economy, as the anaphora for Timcot says, divinity became one with humanity. Let the Lamb come so that we may see him with our eyes immolate him with our hands, and rejoice in him. When not serving as an altar board for the Eucharist, the tabot is stored in a four-legged cubical chest called a manbara tabot, also situated within the Holy of Holies. Some tabotot are said to be lavishly carved, while others are simply adorned. Some are inscribed with the Ten Commandments, for the word tabot means ark or chest, and it is meant to be a representation of one of the tablets of stone contained in the biblical ark of the covenant, which Ethiopians specifically believe resides within the walls of the chapel of the ark of St. Mary of Zion in Aksum, under the guardianship of a single monk appointed for life, who may never leave his post. Such reverence and awe are afforded the tabotot that were you to attempt to venture behind the veil and enter the inner sanctum, your bare feet and prayer shawl notwithstanding, you would be accosted on the spot, most likely with severe blows. It has happened to many an unsuspecting tourist, a fate to which I, thankfully, did not succumb. <laughs> It 
It is terrifying to see a tabit, says Gatachu. It is like coming face to face with a deity. At the occasion, one prostrates oneself to the ground in awe, dread, and respect. Only twice in a year do the Tabatats leave their dark and secluded realms. On the feast day of the church, St. Michael's, St. Stephen's, St. George's, as the case may be, and on Timcot. In the case of the former, it is carried on the head of a priest in festive procession in a circuit of the church building at the conclusion of the divine liturgy. I witnessed one of these processions at St. George's in Addis. What is so extraordinary about Timcott, however, is that the tablet is not just taken out of the church, its place of safety and confinement, but it is literally taken away, in some cases several miles away, to a place where it will rest, guarded in vigil, incense, and song, until the conclusion of the rite of the blessing of the waters on the following day. Now, as I have said, the tablet represents the contents of the ark which resides in Oxum, the covenant, the word of God inscribed on stone. But since it actually functions as the altar board for the Eucharist, the new covenant between God and man, it also at once has sacramental overtones, pointing to the presence of the word of God now incarnate. Christ, the presence of God in the midst of his church. Christ, who is never without his saints. By extension, then, the tabit is the church. Christ in his saints, the great mystery, as the apostle said. In cities like Addis and Oxum and, above all, Gondor, the Timcott procession is an incredible sight to behold. The tabatot from the various churches in the region are solemnly, ceremoniously removed from their seclusions, and each accompanied by its own parish's priests, deacons, and debtara, with copious wafts of incense, wind their way aloft through the streets to a central square. There, coming together, they proceed to the place where they will be bedded for the night and where the waters will be blessed on the morrow. The conjoined procession is led by Sunday school choirs, which have been waiting up to two hours for the Tabatot's arrival. These choristers create a sacred space in front of the clergy, who, with their colorful umbrellas, provide a visual canopy, a ciborium of sorts, over the line of moving, traveling Tabatot. The Sunday school choirs of boys and girls which lead the way are something of an innovation. Created in the 1980s after the forced, the forced closure of the church schools by the ruthless Menegistu regime. In the major cities, they now flourish, each with their distinctive liturgical garb. The divine liturgy and monastic offices, everything done inside the sanctuary are still conducted in Ge'ez, though there has been a gradual transition to the vernacular in the course of the last two decades. The Sunday school choirs are utilized for the outdoor processions, of which there are many, and always offer their contributions in the vernacular, which in most cases is Amharic. At the parish of St. Estefanos in Addis, good attendance up to the age of 11 earns a child the right to join in the St. Stephen's Day celebration with its attending tabat procession. The photo shows several choir members washing their vestments two days before the event. It's all hands-on, no dry cleaning here. <laughs> An ever-present breeze makes for quick drying on the churchyard clothesline. The music and texts of the vernacular Sunday school processional hymns are new, and parallel the creation of the Sunday school choirs themselves. They draw, however, from the ancient Ethiopian liturgical tradition as practiced by the Debtara, 
as well as from the voluminous and varied regional folk repertoire. All Ethiopian church music, whether the ancient Ge'ez chants or the newer Sunday school hymns, is a cappella, the only accompaniment, if at all, being percussion instruments such as the kabaro, the traditional liturgical drum, and the sistrum, a handheld instrument utilized both in Pharaonic Egypt and at the Jerusalem temple. As five small metal discs represent the five mysteries of Ethiopian orthodoxy, the Holy Trinity, the Holy Incarnation, Holy Baptism, the Holy Eucharist, and the Holy Resurrection. The sistrum is played slowly and with great deliberation. It is not an adult rattle. The sound is said to symbolize the resonance of the wings of the cherubim and seraphim in heaven. As for the Sunday school hymns, their rhythms are quite contagious and, like the Ge'ez chants, are attended by a variety of hand and body movements, all of which have centuries-old meaning. A side-to-side -side movement of the hands, for example, reflects the blows that Christ received at his trial, first to one cheek, then the other. Bowing recalls Christ's incarnation, coming down from heaven to save us. I was fortunate enough to witness a choir of young girls practicing on Timcott Eve. A group of boys were hanging around in the back. It didn't take me long to realize that their reason for being there had less to do with what was being sung or the fine performance they were witnessing, <laughs> but with what might take place once practice had ended. None of these newer Sunday school hymns are published. My guide was a real gem and translated 10 of them into English for me. At once simplistic, they are also quite profound, for they underscore the movement that is taking place in the Timcott procession, the coming of Christ and his church to Jordan. One Amharic hymn, for example, draws upon the imagery from Psalm 114, the synoptic accounts of Jesus' baptism, and Luke 15. Seeing the problem of the world, the sun came down, leaving his 99 classes of angels to look for the one lost son and bless him. The king whom the skies could not contain was born and baptized to bless us. The mountains quaked and jumped. The sea also shocked. The ground was unable to hold it. When the sea shocks and the hills dance, when the sky opens and the cloud speaks, the world sees the mystery, the occasion of his baptism. This particular hymn, and several like it, is based on the far older Ge'ez chant which closes the morning office. Leaving the 99 classes of angels, he stood in the midst of the sea. He came in and out in peace. In the latter antecedent hymn, the Jordan is the sea occupied by the dragon beast of Revelation. For Jesus to be baptized is to step into a domain counterclaimed by Satan. The Ge'ez chant thus emphasizes the contest enjoined in the humiliation. The contemporary Sunday school hymn points to the end result, the submission of the waters to the one who left the realm of the 99 classes of angels with the goal to bless us. As the Tabatot attendants and choirs make their way slowly through the streets, an enormous press of humanity follows them, being continuously warned not to draw too near. It is a wild celebrative frenzy that includes singing, dancing, the blowing of inexpensive brass horns, the playing of ritual drums, and the reoccurring, ever reverberating, high-pitched streaks of jubilation from women all across the spectrum of age. More than one writer has likened the whole affair to David's procession with the ark in 2 Samuel 6, with all of its attendant drama. The Tabatot which have otherwise been protected, 
treated with such respect, mystery, and awe, secluded within the individual holy of holies of the respective 40,000 churches in the land, are on Timcott exposed. Oh, they are still covered, to be sure, but they are no longer safe. That which was invulnerable is now vulnerable. Out in the midst of humanity, out in the middle of the crowds, not just whisked once around the church as on its feast day, but carried out into the midst of the city or countryside, as the case may be. Surrounded by faithful, celebrative worshipers, yes, and whomever. A scene like this breathes and breeds unpredictability. In Otis, two years ago, there was a riot during Timcott. Shots were fired. People were killed. Something might happen. The Tabatot are no longer secure. This is the ritual of Timcott, what it means that Christ comes to the waters of John and his saints with him. It means that Christ and his church are exposed to danger. The theophany occurs as Christ is uncovered, naked in the waters of John. From a ritual perspective, Timcott works has such communicative power because of the attendant holiness with which the Tabatot are endowed. The ritual aspects of such vulnerable imminence communicate because of the well-attested backdrop of transcendence. I underscore, Timcott is not play-acting for any of the white-robed, head-covered men and women and children in these scenes. It is not a game of, let's pretend that Jesus is being baptized today. For you see, at dawn on the morrow, these same participants expect to get blessed. And this is the prelude to that blessing. The focus of this well-weaved ritual is not in the first place to make the individual participant ask the question, what should I, as a member of this crowd, now be thinking? But rather, what should I, in these circumstances, be doing? A point to which I shall later return. This is anamesis in its most profound sense. Not a reenacting, not a dramatization, not a symbol of some greater reality. Tim Cott is the coming of Christ from Galilee to Jordan for you. The blessing to be had at the conclusion of all this is not symbolic. It is real. As real a blessing as baptism itself. Once the procession has wound its way through the streets, it arrives at the place where the waters will be blessed. In the country, this might be a lake or a stream or a cistern. In the larger cities, it is a place specifically constructed or adapted for Timcot, a place large enough for the thousands who will spend all night there waiting in vigil. At Gondor, as many as 50,000 crammed into a 17th century double-walled enclosure with several thousand more arriving in the morning. There is singing throughout the afternoon and evening, as well as outdoor preaching. Quite a bit of it, both ecclesiastically organized and ad hoc. A phenomenon that has mushroomed since the 1991 fall of the Derg. In most cases, the laity will listen only to an ordained priest or a monk. Someone, that is, who is known for his piety, his holy lifestyle, his rigorous attention to fasting and prayer. This particular lay preacher whom I witnessed, however, clearly had the attention of quite a few of the thousands of pilgrims who had transversed miles of rocky terrain to be there for the feast. At one point, several hundred hands shot up in the air, accompanied by that exuberant, high-pitched ululation that is the classic sound of Ethiopian praise. I asked my guide what the hand-raising was all about, and he informed me that the preacher had just asked, 
Who here loves Jesus? This past January, the patriarch himself was on hand in Gondor to officiate at the blessing of the waters. It so happened that I, on the eve of Timcot, after witnessing the great procession of the Tabatat, returned long after dark to my hotel, exhausted yet spiritually refreshed. I was sitting outside the hotel entrance, basking in the glow of a billion stars under the clear African night, about to take a sip of a local brew and light up a cigar, <laughs> when an entourage of shiny white official-looking vehicles drove up and out stepped His Holiness, Abunopalos, the Patriarch himself. I quickly hid my cigar and my <laughs> beer <laughs> and greeted him as best I could. Though surrounded by a wave of locals eager to receive his blessing, he put his entrance into the hotel on hold, made time for me, and conversed with me about what I was up to in New York and my interest in Abyssinia. Turns out, he was educated at St. Vladimir's, just up the road, served a parish in the city, and received his PhD from Princeton. <laughs> he knew our neck of the woods quite well. As night falls, the Tabatot are bedded down in tents or other enclosures, but are not abandoned. The priests and deacons keep the night light on with their all-night vigil. The Tabatot are sensed continuously and attended with ancient Ge'ez hymns until the Timcot liturgy commences sometime after midnight. The last of the Timcot chants intoned before the liturgy, which also serves as a textual basis for many of the newer Sunday school hymns for the feast, proclaims, in words drawn from the Matins reading from Matthew 3, Jesus went from Galilee to Jordan. This very simple text recapitulates the movement of the Tabatot out of the churches that is at the heart of the feast. Those few words in the ancient liturgical tongue are sung by the priests and deacons before the tabatot inside the incense-fumed tent for about two hours. The rhythms and intonation varying ever so slightly with each new round of the hymn. There is no one single missal for the rites of the Tim Cot Vigil, and save for the anaphora, nothing as yet available in English. Though similar to the Coptic, Armenian, and Syrian rites, Ethiopia developed its own traditions independent of the other Oriental Orthodox communions. As in the other Oriental churches, there are always four readings at the liturgy, from the Pauline epistles, the general epistles, the book of Acts, and the gospels. For Ethiopian Timcot, the readings are Titus 3, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5, with its rich Trinitarian themes and its reference to the coming of Christ by water and blood. Acts 10, Peter's preaching about the baptism of Christ. Psalm 77, when the waters saw thee, they trembled, thy way was through the sea. And the Holy Gospel, Luke 3, which connects Jesus' post-baptismal prayer to the subsequent theophany. An hour before sunrise and the compound around the pool is bursting at its seams. My guide assures me that he can get me a good view, up close even though most of those at my hotel have left a good hour ahead of me. And Mesvin, son of a priest who translated those Tim Cot hymns, does not disappoint. After making our way through the packed crowd of thousands, he pushes me toward a small opening in the innermost wall surrounding the Tim Cot pool. Dozens of young Zacchaeuses are already up in the trees, <laughs> securing the best possible view. As I'm being jostled this way and that, several from among the throng already on the inside urge me on, literally pulling me in and clearing away a place for me. 
a front row seat with a view to die for. In this case, my outsider status, a Ferengi, is clearly a boon. There are thousands less fortunate than I. The Sunday school choirs have returned and line one side of the pool as the clergy and dignitaries get ready across the way. A priest lights four candles on a simple wreath and sets it on the water. Christ, the light of the world, comes to be baptized by John. The cameras roll. The Markan account of the baptism of Jesus is read. The crowd is hushed. The patriarch chants, Blessed is the Lord, the God the Father, the Pantocrator, Blessed is his only Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and blessed is the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete, the Comforter and Purifier of us all. Amen, the formerly silent crowd responds. And then His Holiness dips his cross into the water and blesses it with the words, Truly God the Father is holy, truly the Son is holy, Truly the Holy Spirit is holy. And with that, the crowd erupts in a cavalcade of that unique high-pitched ululation as naked and almost naked teenagers get ready to dive in and become part of the humiliation too. What is the meaning of this blessing of the waters? Ethiopian Orthodoxy shares with Eastern Christendom several emphases relative to the feast. Among them, Trinitarian Theophany, Light, the Manifestation of the Incarnation, Sanctification of Creation, Bodily Cleansing, and Baptismal Renewal. This last aspect is particularly accentuated by theologians in Ethiopia these days. Archbishop Timotheus, head of the Orthodox Seminary in Addis, told me that individual baptismal remembrance is a strong pastoral concern of the Ethiopian church right now. A remembrance, I would hasten to add, which is conditioned by the entire experience of Timcott itself. To remember one's baptism is to do Timcott. To do Timcott is to remember one's baptism. It is not first an intellectual enterprise, but a physical act, getting wet with the blessed, tabat-approached waters of Timcott. Outer cleansing is the door to inner renewal. With respect to the theophany, perhaps the most prevalent orthodox emphasis in the theological literature, the Ethiopian rituals are quick to point out that the Trinity is made manifest and the Incarnation is revealed precisely as the Son of God leaves the 99 classes of angels and the safe confines of Nazareth, stands in line at the Jordan, and accepts the baptism of John, that is, in the act of the divine humiliation. The theophany of the Trinity is seen in light of that humiliation, as demonstrated in the removal of the tabot from the protection of its church, not as some event apart from it. The waters of the Timcot pool, in turn, are sanctified with the cross, the ultimate instrument of the humiliation. In the Ethiopian baptismal liturgy, the cross is likewise placed in the water and remains in the water while the candidate is baptized. In the introduction to a recently published order of baptism authorized by the patriarch, it is explicitly stated that, quote, when a priest says the prescribed prayer and blesses the water, the water is changed into the real water which came out from the side of our Lord Jesus when he was pierced with the spear while on the cross. Note the connection to the reading from 1 John at the Timcott Liturgy. We, being baptized with that water, shall receive sonship from God and be saved from condemnation. 
Clearly, there is more than representation at work in these rites. There is something somatic going on here, something physical at its core. The baptismal waters are more than a visual illustration of what God does for the soul. They are the very rivers that flowed from Jesus' side by which the whole man is cleansed. Let the body be washed so that the soul may be healed. A kind of reversal of Luther's large catechism claim that where the soul is healed, the body has benefited also. The Ethiopic synaxarium in this regard is quite explicit. At Timcot, they cleanse themselves with holy water in imitation of the baptism of our Lord Christ, and they receive during this festival remission of their sins, provided they continue in the purity which they have received. And again, in Timcot, we ask our Lord Christ to cleanse us from all our sins and to reveal the glory of his Godhead in our hearts, even as he revealed it in the River Jordan. Tied to this aspect of individual sanctification is the parallel dimension of the cosmic transfiguration of all creation in the baptism of Christ. A feature that has emphasized the frequent use of Psalm 114 in the hymnody and at matins, as well as Psalm 77 in the liturgy. When the waters saw thee, O God, they were afraid, yea, the deep trembled. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord. Creation submits to its creator, as the creator submits to and emerges from the waters of John. When all have had the opportunity to be blessed with the Timcod waters, facilitated in Gondor by the use of a garden hose, <laughs> the crowd lingers to join in traditional folk music, listen to preaching, or just hang around to relax and converse. Eventually, the head-born Tabatat emerge from their tents and are returned to their respective churches in a procession similar to the one the day before. Once each tabat has been secured for another year within the confines of its Holy of Holies, the priests make themselves available to bless loaves of bread, which parishioners will take back home with them and consume as part of a festive, eagerly awaited Timcot meal. Timcot with all its multi-layered emphases, has much to teach the Church of the West, and its implications are many. Allow me to focus briefly on four for you to ponder. Number one, Ethiopian Timcot teaches the Church the importance of the role of the sacred and transcendent in liturgical practice. If the heart of the gospel is the proclamation of the great sacramental given and shed for you, a declaration of imminence first embedded in Moses' bold retort, it is your going with us, O Lord, that makes us distinct. Then, from a human point of view, such saving imminence will be effectual to the degree that there is a corresponding antecedent emphasis on God's holy transcendence, his otherness. The God who tabernacles among his people dwells in unapproachable light. It is that God who gives himself to you, humiliates himself for you. Tim Cott works because it so powerfully juxtaposes the imminent the incarnation, the humiliation, the Trinitarian self-revelation against the claim that, as C.K. Barrett put it, it is irreverent and unsafe to see him. The loss of the sacred in Western liturgical practice in the course of the last half century, sacred time, sacred place, sacred past, has weakened the impact of the divine for you. Timcott tells us to cover our heads and take off our shoes. There is such a thing as holy ground. Number two, 
And because there is such a thing as holy ground, liturgy is first a physical activity, not a mental exercise. When we enter a pew, when the organist commences the prelude, when the pastor intones the Holy Gospel according to St. John, when we sing holy, 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 and Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, our first reaction should not be, what should I now be thinking? But rather, what should I now be doing? Peter and Andrew and James and John did not enter into a relationship with the Lord Jesus by first contemplating his words, but by leaving family and jobs and following him, learning to pray like him, a bodily act. Such is liturgy. This, Tim Cott would tell us, is the liturgical root. In the presence of the Christ, the Magi fell down and worshipped him. The evangelist tells us neither what they thought nor what they said. We are given the same with respect to Peter when he saw his boat sinking after the great draft of fish. In all the voluminous material related to worship and the festivals in the Pentateuch, only once is a prescribed text given. For liturgy is first about posture, what to do, what to wear in the presence of the holy. Remember Peter putting on his shirt before swimming to meet the Lord. With bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. Hebrews 10. In Ethiopian orthodoxy, music likewise is a communal somatic experience, leaving the hearers physically engaged. No one sits to listen to a church choir perform. No one sits, period. Your prayer stick keeps you on your feet. It also makes you a member of the band. Well-defined liturgical roles need not imply disengagement. All of this is at one with traditional Ethiopian religious education, which the celebrated Ethiopian historian Richard Pankhurst called one of the oldest continuous systems of learning in the world. A rigorous curriculum lasting up to 40 years that requires the memorization of a voluminous amount of scriptural and liturgical material in Ge'ez. As John Binns puts it, whereas modern education seeks to develop the capacities and abilities of the child, traditional education seeks to enable students to absorb the culture and to be absorbed into it. The Amharic word understand literally means it has entered into me. Traditional Ethiopian learning thus has this almost physical quality. The culture is incorporated into the student and the student is incorporated into the culture. And we are talking here, of course, about the culture, the ethos of the kingdom of God." Unquote. St. Augustine said that much the same thing 1600 years ago in his De Doctrina Christiana, and it is the prescribed pedagogy of Blessed Martin's small catechism. Memorize the text first, then unpack its meaning. The quite organic nature of Ethiopian a cappella singing, whether ancient chant or contemporary hymn, is of one piece with all of this, and quite powerful, and might push us to find ways to revitalize unaccompanied congregational singing in our circles. At the very least, to pull the plug on things electronic. <laughs> there are a growing number of American Ethiopian parish websites that offer a wide array of new Amharic hymns for your listening pleasure, but most of these utilize Western-style accompaniment, Hammond organs and the like. Once you've heard the real deal, some of these sound positively, well, silly. <laughs> Number three. In the thralls of persecution, Ethiopian orthodoxy discovered ways of communicating the faith through revitalized preaching and the liturgical use of youth choirs. Much can be learned about how the latter have stayed true to their indigenous roots, while at the same time providing a vibrancy and connectedness to the church's life and worship. 
This is in contrast, I might add, to the practice in the Ethiopian evangelical churches, where the musical models are imported. An anthem I heard in one of Odysseus' Lutheran parishes was decidedly American country western, and I thought, odd. <laughs> when I asked the president of the congregation about it, he didn't seem to know what I meant by country music. To them, apparently, it seemed as natural as the brightly colored made-in-China plastic sandals which everyone there sports these days. Both the indigenous character of the orthodox youth musical repertoire and the ways in which the new youth choirs are employed are worth further study. There's a dissertation here just waiting to be written. <laughs> and finally, number four. Ethiopian Timcott urges us to define more clearly what we mean by the blessing of God and its relation to the body and the physical creation in general. What is it to be blessed? To have the benediction pronounced over our bowed heads with the sign of the Holy Cross? What does the Holy Apostle mean when he speaks of created things being sanctified by God's word and by prayer? The sanctification of creation, which is one of the theological themes of Timcott, is rooted in the humiliation of the incarnate one who is creation's Lord. This, I would suggest, is the place where a theology of the stewardship of natural resources must begin. As an illustrious graduate of this institution has said, all theology is Christology. The agenda for the Lutheran service book includes 26 rites of blessing, most associated with physical objects like crosses and bells. How is all of that related to what happened when the Son of God stepped into the waters of John? How does God bless? Does not what God bless then become sacred? And coming full circle, what then do we do with sacred things? Ethiopia seems to know. It is a land where a sense of the holy is alive and well. From the 12th century rock-hewn churches of Lalabella to the medieval monasteries of Lake Tana to the ancient capital of Aksum to Timcott in Gondor. My journey there was a dream come true. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a bit of my experience, and I commend it also to you. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. have a few minutes for questions if there are any questions that you'd like to pose to Dr. Byans. Yes. Who's the alum so all theology is pretty solid? David Scare. <laughs> Professor at the seminary in Fort Wayne. Yes. Do Lutheran churches in Ethiopia do it like this as well? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Um, the one Ethiopian, one Lutheran church I did attend, the only aspect at all was a cross similar to what would be seen in the Orthodox churches set up behind the altar. Other than that, no iconography, no ritual like this. They do observe the traditional Ethiopian calendar. So they, you know, they're celebrating the same Christmas at the same time the Orthodox churches.
to answer the first, the, the, the last part first, you did, I did show a slide at the end here of the, it has been a practice in Ethiopia since uh, the 16th century uh, to receive a cross tattoo to the forehead. At, at one point it was mandated um, as, a, as a means of identifying you as a Christian in the midst of the Muslim world. Um, it's optional now as to why there are various versions of the cross and um, that there's a circle around it. I had, it doesn't have any particular significance. I'm not sure, I did not catch the first part of the, your question. Uh, the agent there is public preaching. Public preaching. Why? Yes. Ethiopia, as, uh, as the statistics showed, is 60% Orthodox, add the 8% uh, Lutheran and Pentecostal with it, and you've got 68% of the country traditionally Christian. Um, there, is, there is freedom of religion there right now under the present government system. Um, if you want to know how do they protect themselves uh, through the entire, I don't know if you caught it at all there, but there were military personnel uh, on some of these slides, and they are present everywhere. Okay, um, a little. I mentioned by getting a good seat for the blessing of the waters. Well, there was a military man about, you know, within arm's distance, and his rifle was pointed right on the back of his shoulder, right on <laughs> at me. <It> was, <laughs> That's it. Okay. Yes. Is the Messiah or interwoven with the Ethiopian religion? Masonic? Yes. I, I I would not say so. No, not not that I'm at all aware of. Thank you. Yeah. Far far too removed <coughs> logistically. Yes. How much is your class taking? Did you take all the pictures? I took about 80% of them. Uh, all right. yeah. <laughs> did I take all the pictures? Okay. No, I did not take all of them. <laughs> you talked about this being uh, the great anamnesis. Has this experience changed your Eucharistic theology? I don't know that it's changed it. It has certainly confirmed what I've thought all along. Okay. Um, I, I, I would. The incredible faith of the Christians in Ethiopia, I just can't uh, put it in words. Both the Orthodox and the Lutherans. I did not say much here about the Lutheran Church other than some, a few anecdotes, but uh, some of the Lutheran families that I met there were just, their hospitality was incredible. Uh, just cannot you know, thank God enough for, for the Christian witness that's taking place there, you know, across communions. Uh, sort of to tie on uh, a little bit on your question, one other thing it did confirm to me is the work I did on my dissertation uh, way back in the uh, late 1980s, um, which dealt with uh, water and spirit issues in the Gospel of John, inner and outer cleansing. So those kind of issues, uh, which I had sort of put aside and dust, you know, dust is uh, accumulating on my dissertation, but some of that stuff uh, I felt recon confirmed as I just explored some liturgical aspects here. Yes. What struck me was the expression of the surgical choir, the, the faces. Yes. The expressions were very spiritual. Oh, they're definitely. They're yes. They know what they're doing, and they're into it, and they enjoy it. Um, yes. And, and that, as I said, that's something that really needs to be explored uh, as to what, what has happened in Ethiopia in the, with the youth movement in the Orthodox Church 
you can do the same with the Lutheran churches, the evangelical churches there as, as well, but uh, really incredible in the past 17 years after going through such a incredibly, there's an incredible period of persecution they went through for 17 years in the past 17. How they've responded to the situation is another story that really needs to be told. I don't know about the whole culture, okay? <laughs> I can only work in my circles, okay, and the work that we are given. It certainly would, would go to what we do inside a Christian sanctuary, um, and how we treat places, how is the altar viewed, um, what, do we, you know, what we do at certain points of the liturgy is not irrelevant. Uh, so whether we're standing, sitting, kneeling, what, what are we doing, uh, you know, communicates what it is that we need to be taking then internally. I guess my main point here with, with that whole kind of issue is that uh, um, certainly the message of the gospel is what God has done for us. The flip side of that is who is this God who is acting for us? And that's communicated physically among other things. Yes, I, I, I do intend to do a second lecture. Uh, the project I'm working on with that um, was mentioned, uh, Marian iconography. There is a dominant theme in Ethiopian um, iconography of Mary under a canopy of angelic wings. Very, I wouldn't say totally unique, but you know, it's a very prevalent image in Ethiopia. That tied to the whole issue of uh, the presence, and no one asked this question, did I see the Ark of the Covenant? Um, okay. that, the whole, that whole aspect of the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant associated with so much of Ethiopian worship and art. Uh, so I'll be exploring those things in the next year. Great to have so many of you come out tonight. Really appreciate it. said it was wonderful it is wonderful to see so many here this evening and what an amazing way to bring closure to the semester and to this academic year Patrick thank you very much <laughs>